fantasy and some flights. Exploring the realms of beer, board games, books, and bourbon. Welcome to another episode of the Fantasy and Some Flights podcast. I'm Nelson. I'm Dalton. And we got a book topic episode here for you all about character arcs. Yeah. So how characters arc through the... No, that was dumb, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> but like, kind of like uh, how character development, kind of how they, they progress yeah. through a story and how yeah. they grow. How change happens. How change happens, yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm really excited for this one, mainly because we like kind of skirted around the topic mm -hmm. in our last 25 episodes, but yeah, <laughs> without right. actually like putting... Uh, sure. I was going to say pen to paper, but I guess like... Yeah, voice to mic. Voice I, to mic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> however that works. I, I think it will fill in some of the gaps between nicely between like when we talked about sort of character development in the heroes and villains story uh, episodes, right? Versus like story arc, which is again not specific to character. So this is kind of like fitting in between those and filling in that gap a little bit. So yeah, I talk about yeah, I I I'm excited to dive into it, but. We kind of have a a special augmented booze section mm -hmm. today, so we are drinking, of course, but mm -hmm. Dalton, you want to carry it away with what, what we are drinking? Yeah, so today we're sharing, um, so that's the first special thing. Like, we have separate glasses, but... Like. Yes, <laughs> we're not sharing spit, but we are yeah. sharing <laughs> liquor. Um, it's from the same bottle. Um, so today we are drinking um, Michter, U.S. number one small batch Kentucky straight bourbon. Whew. Colon. <laughs> <laughs> Colon. <laughs> Return of the Illus. <laughs> oh, B-side. Um. <laughs> yeah, B-side, exactly. Welcome to the B-sides. Um, so Michter's is one that's kind of funny for me because it was like it was like the second bottle of bourbon that I ever bought and I didn't like it. <laughs> and, oh. <laughs> and I think it was because the, like, I just, I, I don't know why. Like, it is different than some of the earliest stuff that I tried. Okay. And so now that, like, I have drank a lot of bourbon, I was like, you know, it, I'm... I see this everywhere. Like it's still really popular. Let me give it another try. And like now, now I really like it. Um, so is this like the original bottle? Or you... no? Okay. <laughs> I was like, wow, that, that's impressive. <laughs> no, I did finish it. When I bought my second bottle of bourbon, I was not at a point in my life where I could afford to have multiple bottles of bourbon. <laughs> so yeah. Okay. I did drink it, but I just like I've just stayed away from it. But it's a pretty, it's a trusted brand at this point. So it's oh, okay, established good. well within the industry. There's a lot of Michter stuff out there. Um, this like number number one series. There's like there's like four or five different like there's a bourbon and a rye and a couple of different other things. Cool. And all of them are good. They are, uh, and that is like their like quote lowest quality. And it's not low quality at all. It's definitely like mid tier stuff. What's the price point on it? This one's like thirty five. Okay. Yeah, okay. So yeah. it's very much a mid tier at at their low end, and then they go higher from there. And so this one specifically, like in the nose, it'll have like sort of some black cherry and some oak, maybe like a cola kind of thing going on. I can see that. Yeah. yeah. Or I can smell that, I guess. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can see that it looks brown. Yeah. <laughs> Fair. Yeah. And then it has like, again, kind of like a black coffee. I got like maybe some toffee or like some other like, that's kind of like the vanilla and other like sweet things coming in. Um, and then like a very standard, like just kind of smoke and oaky finish, which is really nice. Yeah. And again, it lists on here that it's a small batch. And that was something that... I guess kind of already taking us into the mind section a little bit. <laughs> Small Batch has been something that's been on my mind. We had a discussion in the Discord in our kind of like our section dedicated to booze about it. Like what does Small Batch mean? And I realized like, okay, in the whiskey episode, like we really didn't cover that. Correct. Uh, so I, was I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so it was something just kind of, kind of for us to talk about. So first thing to know, you will generally see something, a whiskey labeled as either Small Batch or Single Barrel. Or it won't list either. Okay. Um, so if it's just listing either, then generally what that means is that's like, that's like your big like you're a big Jim Bean or something and what they're doing is they're making lots and lots of batches of things coming out of a lot of different barrels and then they are blending them again together to get like a consistent flavor profile because they want the flavor of their whiskey to be the exact same every time um, that's like the something that you're paying for yeah and so small batch will step away from that small batch says that we're only going to blend a certain number of batches or even a certain number of bail barrels together so it's basically a quality indication that they have blended fewer barrels from fewer batches so i may be jumping ahead so i apologize uh -huh. does that mean that like the small batches are going to taste different from like maybe the same named thing but from mm -hmm. a different small batch i don't know if that question made it does any sense, it does but... <laughs> the answer is yes the, it, small oh, batches cool. okay. can have variability from batch to from bottle to bottle from basically and uh, that's why you didn't like the mixtures the first time but that, <laughs> <laughs> that's right, i got a bad batch obviously <laughs> at our level of like 
ba- like mid tier connoisseurs, like we are probably not going to be able to taste much of it. Okay. Yeah. Um, especially not like maybe if we put like three side by side, maybe we could sort of, but in a blind taste, probably not. Okay. You know? And especially not if you are like doing what we're doing, where we buy a bottle, finish it, and then buy another <laughs> bottle, and you're not comparing back to back. Right. You know, like we would never pick it up. Okay. Um, but yes, technically they they do have some variability. Um, single barrel is then the extreme, where it's literally they just open a barrel, they put it in a bottle, and they sell it to you. Oh, okay. And so those can have a lot of variability in them. And generally what they're doing for single barrel, they will taste the barrel as it ages, and then they will take it off the shelf as it gets ready. <laughs> like when it tastes good? Yeah, basically. <laughs> like when it has the flavor profile that they oh, that's want. cool. Or they will, uh, a lot of them will like move it up and down in the warehouse, because if it's higher up, then it's exposed to higher temperatures. That's crazy. And higher temperature swings, right? Oh, cool. Okay. And so they will use that to help control how much that specific barrel is going in and out of the wood through the temperature swings. That's so, like... That's way more than I ever want to think about. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, so that's why single barrel is more expensive, obviously, yeah. because they are, it's been given individual attention. And it's almost like a it's almost like, I guess, how sushi is like a chef's like expression of a single taste. You know, like that's kind yeah. of what single barrel is. They okay. went for like a specific, almost like artisanal type of taste. The like distiller did the master distiller. And they're they're giving that to it's you. It's like their baby, right? Exactly, it's like their baby. <laughs> they're coddling it the whole way through, right? Okay. Right. And a barrel will only yield something like a hundred to two hundred bottles. That's actually way more than I thought. Oh like, yeah, they're I, big. <laughs> I, like, for whatever reason, I was just like, I don't know, like twenty. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they are pretty big because yeah, fifty-five gallon generally. Okay. In that range, and that's so, a lot. That's a lot of whiskey. Yeah, that's a lot of whiskey. <laughs> so because of that, and because of the individual attention, they can only do that for so many barrels at a time. Right. And so the ones that they aren't managing will just go into like their big batches. And then these single barrel ones are like, they're, yeah, the ones that they're babying, they're trying to get a specific taste out of. They taste like very unique. And again, they can even have, like, they will have variability that even you and I could taste from cool. like from barrel to yeah. barrel, you know? Dude, so the single barrel. Do they like r- reference that somewhere on the bottle? I've yeah. never spent this much money on whiskey, so I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah, like, they will tell you generally like a batch number and even oh, like cool. a barrel number. So like they will, it will be all coming from a, uh, they'll make a large batch and they're like, we're going to make single barrel whiskey out of this batch. Okay. So the batch will go into multiple barrels. Yeah. Right. And so, but each barrel generally they'll try to get it within a, a similar, because it's coming from the same starting point going into very similar barrels. Yes. So those like within a certain batch, like Booker's does that. Where it'll be like it's this batch number, and you can taste the difference between like Booker's batch six and nine. Or I whatever. think that's awesome. Yeah, I, I, that's just such a cool concept for to me. For sure, for sure. So they are more expensive because of that. Single barrels are, again, because of the individual attention. They're generally been aged a lot longer because like they're wanting to take the time to make something really good and artisanal. <laughs> yeah, right. You know. So like when when you say aged longer, is that ten, fifteen years? Or? Yeah, good question. So because bourbon is coming out of a newly charred barrel. Okay. You actually, they don't want to age it into like 20, 25, 30 years like you do scotches because there's so much power in a new, newly charred barrel that it'll, it'll overpower any like delicacy in the whiskey by the time okay. you get to like 20 and 30 years. So like even like, like, like the, like the Jim Bean family of distilleries has put out like 23 and like 25 year <laughs> like expressions, but they like, you can go on and look and like the owners are like, it's not good. I don't know why people buy it. Like, <laughs> you might as well just go chew on a stick of wood. Like, I don't know why people buy this. And they're not always they're not always like that, but generally I, that's I would how fall it for that marketing play. Like, right. it's like, oh, twenty three years. That seems like it would be good. Yeah, and I just buy it. And then <laughs> I would... It seems like eight to twelve is kind of a sweet spot for bourbon. Okay, um, and past that, it can be really nice to get into like fifteen and eighteen. But again, it's going to start getting more and more and more woody and oaky, okay. and it's going to yeah, that makes sense. overpower. And so, what they do for a lot of small batches, kind of splitting the difference. You know, they're going to shoot for something like ten to twenty five barrels. Generally, there's actually not a requirement. Um, okay, so like I think uh, like Elijah Craig, I, I feel like. I looked it up. I think they use like 100 and maybe even 200 barrels. They are like very... Elijah Craig is a small batch, yep. but they use like a lot of barrels. And so it's very consistent for a okay. small batch. Yeah. Um, but like other like famous or I guess big name small batches like Knob Creek's stuff is all small batch. Okay. And they're generally using like six to eight year barrels okay. and mixing. Elijah Craig is again, eight to 12 years. Um, Four Roses and Mick- Michters, which is what we're drinking now. Um, I couldn't find like age statements on, but they're both also very common small batches. And so it is, I would say... Small batch will be an indication of quality. It's generally an indication of mid tier type quality, um, although it can be higher. But again, like Elijah Craig, we we like it a it's lot. A, yeah, it's a great whiskey. Yeah, you just sip on. Yeah, exactly. And it's in that eight to twelve year barreling that they're mixing. Wow, um, that's crazy. That mm-hmm. like because it's a really cheap whiskey, right? You can get it yeah. sub thirty, yeah. but it's been aged for eight years. That's just that's yeah. interesting to me. It's extremely extremely so, good quality for its price point. Elijah Craig is. So I may be completely off on this, but like I, I've heard like cask strength or barrel strength mm-hmm. whiskey mm-hmm. is 
is that typically going to be a small or single batch whiskey or does it not have to be it doesn't have to be okay. necessarily a lot so, of times they will yeah um, so what like what is a cast string <laughs> so when they when they barrel it it is at a higher proof than what you drink and the main reason that they do that is because it's expensive to have it on the shelf right so they would rather like kind of pack the alcohol into a barrel okay and then yeah. water it down when it comes out later yeah okay you know so exactly because they're limited on volume of the barrel that makes sense you know okay um so cask strength will be more like 55 to 65 percent alcohol Damn. by volume yeah it's heavy. <laughs> and so you can buy it that way like if it says like barrel strength or cask strength or sometimes even like bottled in bond which um, has a slightly different meaning but it's kind of a, kind of a similar thing all, all of that will come at that like higher percentage because they just haven't watered it down yet got it okay um, but it doesn't mean that it came necessarily from a single barrel but a lot of times they will Okay. Um, oh, okay. Because they're like, you know, we're just, we spent all this time, like, you're just going <laughs> to taste it the way it's meant to be had yeah. or something. And so they just yeah. don't. Okay. Got um, it. They just don't give it to you. They don't water it down. Yeah. But you are supposed to water it down when you drink it. I, I do. Yeah. <laughs> but some people don't. Some people just like it that way. Some people are impressive. It's yeah. <laughs> I think it's, I think it's overpowering. I, I do. I, usually, if I, like, I buy, um, I bought barrel bourbon. We talked about that. Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. Charles recommended. And that's, that's that way. It's at like 57 or 60%. Okay. Yep. Um, and so I usually, like, taste it at that just to, like, see what it's like. And it's like, wow, that's like, I get a lot of the flavor, like it's really Ow. coming across, but it's also a ton of alcohol. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so I like to water it back a little yeah. bit. Sorry for kind of derailing. I was just kind of no, curious. No, this is, this is what we're talking about. So so all of that to say, that's what's been on my mind. The difference between small batch and um, single barrel. What it means to you as a consumer, if you are kind of just looking to get off of like the, I guess the lower end and start moving up, finding some things that say small batch on it is a really good place to start. Um, it does not have an FDA requirement to list it on there. So there's no, like, it doesn't actually mean anything. But okay. by convention, what it means is that they are using 10 to 25 barrels. They can use more again, but like generally that's kind of what they're trying to do. Um, and it means that they are, they're using some of those barrels that they are kind of babying along. So they're trying to get something that's like a really nice, consistent flavor. But it does, they do allow some of that, like some fluctuation and some variability that you're probably not going to taste differences in bottles between Elijah Craig. But theoretically it's there. Yeah. You know? Um, but it, it does mean that like it's like like I said, Michter's is a is a small batch. If you see that, that's probably a good place to start. Or Elijah Craig. Or Elijah Craig. Yeah. <laughs> Still love Elijah Craig. I actually I really need to drink more from Heaven Hill. Who is that makes Elijah? Elijah Craig. Okay, yeah. Yeah, they own Elijah Craig. They own like several they own um Pikesville. Like you've had yeah, the Pikesville, right? Yeah. yeah, they they the same people. Okay. And I, I just I want to and also Elijah Craig is like Michter in that it there's like baseline Elijah Craig and then it goes up. Yeah, there, yep. There's a lot of other things in the Elijah Craig line that I've never tried that I um, that are, actually, I've had the bottled in bond. Uh, Harlan brought it to the game night. Oh, okay, cool. I, I think so, if I'm remembering right, I think that's what he brought. He's gonna like message me if I got it wrong. So I'm sorry <laughs> yeah, if I didn't. But <laughs> he'll let us know. Yeah. But it was really good. Yeah. So so Mictors, let's do a cheers. Um, oh yeah. I I want to start out because I don't want to be influenced by your. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> but so I I actually really enjoy this. So I think I have maybe tasted this before at your place. Mm -hmm. Maybe some I just I don't know. I just pour myself something. Yeah, uh, but <laughs> there's I, a lot I of do... bottles to choose from. So. <laughs> <laughs> that is very true. I, I I really enjoy this. This would be a three cheers for me. Like I mm -hmm. I don't think that I'm going to go out and buy it, mm -hmm. especially because like Elijah Craig for me would probably be that four cheers. Yeah, and I I don't know. I just like I'm not in that area of my like whiskey tasting journey or whiskey drinking journey that i would probably want both of them yeah so th this would be that three cheers but yeah. i highly recommend for sure yeah the three it's the same for me the three being kind of buy and try i would definitely recommend this as a buy and try especially and even for you now that you've known that you've liked this one which is the bourbon you can try the other ones um, yeah like there's a um i forget what what all is in the line of like the number the u.s number one it just has like a little on the label it says like michter's u.s number one um, nice. And and that's like their low end series, which we've called the mid tier. And so you can try. Other, I would like recommend trying other ones from that series. That's probably like some of the things I'm going to try next. Cool. Yeah. No. That I've never known. I kind of just assumed that they were the same thing. So <laughs> small and single barrel. Oh like, yeah. Whatever. I don't know. Yeah. It is an indication of quality um, by convention. <laughs> <laughs> kind of. Asterisk. Kind of. Asterisk. Um. <laughs> exactly. Um, I do know, like for instance, that Evan Williams has like a twenty five dollar single barrel. I've never had it. Um, I hear like actually decent things. Okay. But. Single barrel doesn't mean expensive, <laughs> necessarily. <laughs> That's true, okay. But Evan Williams puts out a lot of barrels. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that, that that's super interesting. And it's kind of fun because, like, it, it was on the Discord, so, like, it, I I can definitely tell it's been on your mind. Mm -hmm. and I, I'm happy that you at least let me know about it. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, um, so, what else has been on your mind? Yeah, so I, I finally finished Rhythm of War. Oh, exciting. So, that was, that, that was exciting. I, I'm... I'm glad to have finished that because now I can actually like click on all the, you know, things oh, mark spoilers online. Yeah. And so so that's really nice. Yeah. There 
like I we talked in the last Fireside episode that it was kind of dragging a little bit. Yeah. That quickly ramped. Okay, good. So like in the last two hours of that book, so much happened. Wow. Almost to the point where it's I wish it was like mm. a little bit longer and like I had a little bit more time to digest it just because there was so much time or yeah. so many things that happened in such a short time. Yeah. And so that was exciting. Hot takes from Nelson. <laughs> Rhythm of War isn't long enough. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know about that. Uh, <laughs> but but so that that was kind of interesting. It would probably be something that I want to go back and mm. re-listen to. Yeah. Like maybe just like the last couple chapters. Okay. Just to kind of because like so much information is happening and they're like Sanderson writes it in such like a like very short segments and it flips around to multiple perspectives a lot and mm-hmm. a lot of things are happening to like all the characters in the book. Mm-hmm. And so I forgot what happened to a lot of characters. Yeah. So it's, I'm going to probably go back and reread it. I'm just going to give myself a little bit of time to digest that. Gotcha. Yeah. So going from like Rhythm of War, the next thing that I'm like, I have on my radar to do is like Dawn Shard, which is like a the next novella that takes place. I think it's a little bit after Rhythm of War. Okay. But like his, his novellas typically don't follow uh, main characters. This mm-hmm. one follows like Lopin. And somebody else, I don't remember who, but mm-hmm. I love Lopin. He's like the Hardazian that's just like oh, yeah. the one armed Hardazian that's, that's just right. like just makes jokes all the time. Yeah. But it's only available in ebook. So oh, gotcha. like you can't get a physical copy and you cannot get an audiobook. Huh. Um because I think he just put it out so quickly, people are just like, Oh shit, like <laughs> <laughs> don't have time to do this. So yeah. My wife and I share a Kindle, which means my wife uses a Kindle. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I plan on, I think she's moving over to a physical copy. So I, I, I want to read that cool. um, soon. But out, outside of that, um, I have started Red Rising because we're we're doing our Red Rising episode on April 8th. Yep. And so I, I've started reading that. That book is phenomenal. I know. I, I can't. I'm so excited to start rereading it. Uh, yeah, I have like five hours left in my current Witcher, and, <laughs> uh, and then I'm gonna switch over. Yeah, and, and to kind of like go along with that, we we are planning on starting a book club in in mm, the Discord. Mm. Actually, by the time this releases, it, it probably will already be out. The details will be out. But what mm. we're planning on doing is meeting on like every two weeks, and we're gonna pick a book and read through it, mm-hmm. uh, read up and at least up until this point, and then we're gonna hop on a day of the week, maybe for thirty minutes to an hour, to just kind of like talk about that part of the book yeah and we're starting with red rising because it would be cool to have like the community read it and then we'll release we hope to have it um the this book will be complete book club wise by the time that the episode releases on april 8th right. so if you had any reservations about reading <laughs> it for whatever reason th- this is a great opportunity for you to jump in and read it and discuss it and talk with you know other people that are reading and love the book yeah so i i'm really excited i think that this is gonna be an awesome idea yeah um and so I- i'm really excited to see where it takes it also like it's it's nice to be able to talk to other people like we talk a lot about books but yeah. it's, it'd be ni- it's gonna be nice to talk to other people that don't maybe share the same viewpoints as we do right and, and talk through the the, b- the book on a more frequently frequent basis for sure for sure yeah and for us it'll kind of seed the conversation going into the book analysis yeah episode yeah you know? so, totally yeah so we'll just jack all those ideas <laughs> claim them as our own. yeah exactly <laughs> we'll probably get we may give credit i don't know we'll see yeah. <laughs> <laughs> again that that's red rising the episode is coming out on april 8th and the book club will be hosted in our discord which yeah. you can find in the show notes or mm-hmm. uh just search it yes so, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the icebreaker that you, I was about to say propose, but that's not the right word. You posed yes. <laughs> in, the, in the in the last Fireside episode, which which is tying into our, kind of our conversation that we're going to have today all about character arcs. Yes. And, and that was, do you think that George R. R. Martin's habit of killing off characters, especially like main characters, yeah. is, is effective storytelling or is it just lazy writing? Yeah. And so I think that we had a pretty good conversation about this in, on the yeah. Fireside episode, but I, I did put it out to Instagram. Uh-huh. I put it as just kind of like a poll mm-hmm. to see that you can vote for one. And and it came out to be 77% of people thought that it was effective storytelling and okay. 23% thought it was lazy writing. Yeah. Which I think that's kind of what we settled on. Yeah. And uh, so we I talked with a couple of people out there uh, about it. And so like one D20 Woodworking, who is one of our fellow board vengers, uh-huh. uh, we were talking about it. And he was saying that, especially when you look at it from like how it was perceived at the time, because when he was releasing these books, nobody did that. Yeah. Um, so so it was true. completely new. It was completely like you just like weren't 
that wasn't something that you were expecting going mm. into Game of Thrones, the first book. Yeah. You just kind of assume that the characters are going to be safe. And then when they started dying, <laughs> that, that was just, you know, completely out of left field. Yeah. I, I thought that was a really interesting how that kind of played into it a little bit. And so I think we're seeing more of that where more characters are following the Game of Thrones because they've yeah. seen the success that Martin has had with the story. So I think that in that sense, it is a really good point that it is very effective storytelling because it was... It created shock value. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> of course. We had someone in the Discord, a uh, username Padaweb, who mentioned that they thought that the deaths kind of catapulted the book beyond the main readers of fantasy books. Yes. I thought that was a really interesting point. Yeah, because it definitely did. Like, like it hit. First of all, yes, it hit mainstream culture, especially when the movies started releasing. But I also I knew a lot of people who read Game of like Song of Ice and Fire. Um, who were not like avid readers, right? They yeah. just like somebody yeah. had introduced it to them and, and they got hooked on it. And it's like, that is not a gateway book. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, to use like some of our board game terminology, like those are like thick, they're heavy, they got tiny little text, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. even though they're like 800 pages or whatever. Right. Um, like it's an undertaking to get, but people still did it. And I think, yeah, part of it is probably because like, I think maybe other genres were doing that, you know, like horror genres and, yeah. you know, um, that people would get like sucked in and like characters weren't always safe. But for whatever reason in fantasy, it kind of felt like they were um, because we lived in this fantasy world. Or whatever. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so I just thought that was a really interesting uh, and an interesting perspective on, on the effect that that his style had. Right. I, I really enjoyed the conversations that we were having on Discord around this question because people were talking about how, you know, it made it feel more realistic. It, mm -hmm. It's like it's not. We, we've talked about plot armor before where a character mm -hmm. because they're important are not going to be adversely affected by the story uh right. so mm -hmm. and that's just not a thing in martin's books yeah a couple of other people were talking about like tuck nelly and jim nicky were talking about how it creates suspense mm -hmm. because like it, like there's no really coming back from from a character death yeah um so it's like that a lot of books will create if you do suspense. it'll totally invalidate <laughs> <laughs> But, but it creates the suspense because there is, like, you don't know if the person that you're really enjoying, like, learning about mm -hmm. is going to be there. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think that uh, Jim Nicky brought up a good point that it, it kind of sets the tone that this story may not have a happily ever after, mm -hmm. which yeah. I think is a really cool, you know, storytelling device. Like, mm -hmm. typically we expect a book to finish and we're going to be satisfied and the good guys won. Mm -hmm. and that just may not happen in Game of Thrones. Yeah. And that is pretty clear within the first half of the first book. Yeah. This is a real world or okay, that that's kind of weird. <laughs> but like <laughs> like in real in the real life, like there are consequences for your mm -hmm. actions and the good guys don't always win and it's just like a cool unique take on the fantasy story as well. Yeah. I think uh like George R. R. Martin does such a great job with his characters. Mm -hmm. I think that he probably is my favorite author when it comes to character arcs, character development, mm -hmm. and writing a character. Yeah. So let's transition into that into that discussion now and let's talk about character arc. Yeah. So can you give me a brief description of character arc? And it, like the terminology is kind of fun, right? Character yeah. arc versus story arc. So like yeah. so how is character arc different than story arc mm -hmm. in, in your in your opinion? Yeah, it's a great question. And it is like an important, I think, dis distinction just to kind of frame our, our topic and frame our discussion. Um, so going back to the story arc episode, a story arc is kind of the process of change in the story. Um, and it'll yep. it'll be kind of the movement of characters between situations and states in yeah. the context of the story. And so what we're talking about here tonight in terms of character arcs is that a character arc is really the process of change within a character. Um, yeah. So as opposed to a character moving from places to situations and beating the bad guy at the end of the story, um, it's how is the character themselves changing over the course of the story. Um, and yeah. that's different, again, from character development. Um, we covered a lot of character development in Heroes and Villains where we talked about, like, okay, uh, having backstory, having um, having quirks, having modes of speech, have, you yeah. know, like the things that make having strengths and weaknesses, like the things that make a character and give them, like, definition and give them a uniqueness and a, a distinction from the other characters in the story. Like that's all kind of character development content. And it's, it's certainly like relevant in this discussion, um, but we're not talking about necessarily like, here's how you make a good character, right? Yeah. We're talking about how does specifically, I think the key word is change. How does your character change over the course of the story? Yes. I, I think you absolutely nailed that. The yes. <laughs> score <laughs> one point to Dalton, one point for Dalton. <laughs> Woo. Suck it, Nick. Oh. <laughs> 
Man, throwbacks. <laughs> I'm sorry, Nick. Um, <laughs> oh, jeez. Um, That's I'm fine with that as a running joke on yeah. the podcast. By the way, every time every one of us gets an arbitrary point, we just pull farther ahead of Nick. In the <laughs> I hope Nick's okay with it. So yeah, um, I mean, it doesn't matter. <laughs> maybe, maybe we should have him on at some point to have him defend. Try and redeem himself. <laughs> Try and redeem himself. So Nick, you were losing by a lot. <laughs> God, that's funny. Uh, so change, change. I think I agree with you, is that key word. Yeah. And you can have character development or uh, how to make a good character, but it, it's almost like if you looked at how you would do a character development at the start of the book versus the end of the book, it would look completely different. Mm, yeah. Um, so th- this could go into, like when we talked about uh, character development and working to create motivations mm-hmm. and all of this like what is the heroes the protagonist or the villain's motivation yeah uh, that will change with a good character arc yes absolutely um, and so I, I think that there are like Harry Potter is a great example of this yeah where at the beginning of the series mm-hmm. Harry's primary motivation was to just get out of Muggleville right he, right. Just, he just wanted to not <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> TM um <laughs> Like he, he was treated horribly. He yeah. didn't fit in. Yeah. And that like it's almost like a survival type it's, motivation. It's a survival thing. And like he was given this like his motivation is to just, you know, be somebody that actually means something in a world which was presented in the first mm-hmm. the first book. Yeah. And that, that quickly transitions to, Hey, I'm the chosen one, I have to kill this dark lord. And, <laughs> and like so so his his clear motivation at the beginning of Sorcerer's Stone is completely different than what it is at the be at the end of goblet of fire yeah and that that's a good example of character arc yeah um or- yeah yeah and he also like i think there's some really good examples throughout that throughout that series because his motivation even of why he is defeating voldemort can change a little bit right at, at one point it is just safety it's like we just need to have a safe society and you know we need to defeat voldemort to do yeah. that but it's also a large part of it is linked to like closure for himself right for the death of his parents and for this like kind of horrible uh, path that his life was set on from the you know from when he was born um, that he didn't have any uh, ability to influence and now he does and he's kind of getting like a personal closure uh, for that and I think that's play that plays out specifically over book seven right where it, <laughs> yeah. it becomes much less about beating Voldemort just to like beat the Dark Lord and it right. becomes about like the personal impact that that's having on that that's having on Harry yeah so one, another kind of question that I, I was brainstorming which I don't think I have an answer to um, but you're more knowledgeable than me in <laughs> in books. So why do you think it's called an arc? So mm. like we have story arc and that means because like there's the climax and we typically think of that in the pyramid shape yeah. or like the triangle shape. But like why do you think that it's called character arc rather than like character progression or something similar like yeah, that's that? That's a really good question. Um, I think I think the honest answer, I mean like we're, first of all, we're not like, what's the word for somebody who study, studies words? I don't know what that's called. Smart. smart. Uh, <laughs> we're, uh, we're not smart. Um, <laughs> But it, so like my first instinct is like it, it probably just comes from story arc. I think story arc was probably coined first and this comes from that. Okay. But I could also see like if you're thinking of character arc as defining change and you're thinking of it as sort of like a rate of change, it feels like a character will start from a position that is stagnant and they will over the course of the book do a lot of changing. And oh, then by okay. the end, they're yeah. kind of stagnant again. Okay. Right. Like, I don't know if that's why, but like that would kind of, I guess, make sense to me. Right. It goes from the beginning of the book of like little change through a period of high amounts of change. And then they're kind of like self-actualizing by the end of the book and they're becoming more, I guess, rounded and solid in who they yeah, are. Yeah. That, that makes a lot of sense. I, I, yeah. I like that. So it may be total BS, but <laughs> that's what we're going to go with. Yeah. Yeah, sure. We'll go with that. So, um, kind of question that follow up question from that does does a character climax or character arc climax coincide with the climax of the story arc? Oh, that is a good question. I think it feels like often, but it doesn't have to. Right? Okay. I'm trying to think of like a good. So, like, I, I think like especially in like Game of Thrones or uh-huh. books with multiple different characters in them, the story arcs are at different points. Than other character story arcs, or mm-hmm. I'm sorry, the character arcs are at different points than other character story arcs. Yeah. Um. So like Jamie Lannister is reaching the climax of his story arc way before, or at a different time than Bran is. Yeah. And so I think that, I think that a lot of the times, a lot of the character arcs will co- coincide with the story, like climax. The mm-hmm. climax for both of them will coincide, but they don't necessarily have to. Mm-hmm. Um, especially for stories that have multiple characters like one yeah. really good thing about that is yes you can 
you can use character arcs um, throughout tension points in a story arc um, to give it more kind of weight, right? I guess Boromir's death comes to mind. Like, Boromir's oh, death yeah. is, the, is the personal climax of his character arc, but is actually probably just a tension point for the rest of the story, right? Yeah. It is the breaking of the Fellowship. Like, that's a really big deal <laughs> yeah, in the story. Yeah, that's that's big. Yeah, but the fact that Boromir <laughs> dies is not a big deal in the story. Like, in a, in a, in and of itself. Yes. Um, okay, The I fact that saying. Boromir died is not significantly important. It, but could it's a, have, it could have been someone else. Yeah, it right? could have been someone else. But for him, you know, this resolution <laughs> of... Um, it was his, a big deal for Boromir. It was a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> Boromir's death was a really big deal to him. Um, that's very true. But the events leading up to his death were his climax, right? His yes. death was kind of a result of it. Yeah. But, like, struggling for the ring, which is kind of like that personal failure, like realizing his mistake, fighting to protect the hobbits, failing at that, and then his conversation with Aragorn where he's kind of like recognizing him as his king and like charging him to protect yeah. his people and everything. Like there's a lot of character arc going on there. Yes. Oh yeah. Very quickly. I, I, I think so too. And to stick with Lord of the Rings because Frodo goes through a, a, a very strange character arc, I think. <laughs> he does, <laughs> right? yeah. Because like he sets out uh, with the intentions of getting rid of the ring. And mm-hmm. then he, once we get to like the council of Elrond, he volunteers to go destroy the ring. And then as he progresses through the story, he mm-hmm. slowly becomes corrupted by the ring. And so his character arc is very, you know, it's kind of like reverse. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like you, you would want to see or like a, a typical story would see the main character growing more and more involved with their main task. Whereas mm-hmm. this one, it's it's the reverse of that. Yeah. And so to kind of go back to do they coincide the climaxes of both? I think maybe probably the main characters do. Yeah. yeah that's a good but, point. But not all the characters yeah so like frodo's climax of his character development arc uh-huh is you know him i guess he doesn't really drop the ring but he you know trying to drop the ring into, <laughs> yeah. into uh mount doom whereas boromir's is not yeah i think like both of those highlight that change can be positive or negative and that's also a really Ooh, that's a good point yeah, yeah it's a, it's an important distinction when you're just trying to kind of think through what's what's going on with characters because i think when you're when you start to think of okay character arc is change what can change you can start to break down into like lots of things that a character could change it, it could be like their like their strength or their power you talked about that with frodo right he's he kind of grows weaker over the course of yeah the, of the of the story um it could be like morality right a character could and because we see smeagol go through that yeah right of like yeah, a, a positive be. and a negative change in his like personal morality and i think the the reason that i think that that's so important voldemort over the course of the harry potter se- series has a has an incredible character arc. Okay. Right? Because he goes o- from... Over, like, the entirety of his character, not not just, like, Sorcerer's Stone to Deathly Hallows, but, like, 50 years before. Well, that is true. Yeah, I was thinking of, like... I think what I was thinking of is, like, what you find out and how Voldemort kind of evolves to you as, oh, a, as okay. a reader yeah, yeah. Um, and your impression of him as a character from, like, some weird dude on the back of some guy's head, <laughs> you know, yep. until, like, the 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 person with the elder wand fighting the final boss, right? That, that is fighting. Yeah. So he has a lot of, um, and then like you find out his backstory, right? He had like a negative character arc in morality, but over the course of the story, he has a positive character arc in strength. Okay. Right? Yeah. So you can start to okay, kind of break yeah. down how do how do, how are these characters changing? Um, is it positive or negative? And sometimes it can be both, right? Yeah. Um, or it can be kind of like a, like a wave Zuko, <laughs> right? From Avatar yeah. has a, has a big change um, in both power and like morality over the course of the story, positive and negative directions. I'm 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 getting drawn back to the Stormlight Archives. So mm-hmm. the the Stormlight Archives they have these Night Radiants, which need to progress through five levels of like vows that each order of the Night Radiants takes. And each yeah. time that they make a vow, they get uh, more powers. Level up. Level up exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and so it, it's almost like making an equation out of character arc mm-hmm. because you have to physically voice words which are unique to your your specific order of night radiant but you can say the words all you want but it's until you actually mean them that yeah. you actually like progress to that next level and so i think that's like i, I never that's not even in my notes like i just like <laughs> like as you were describing that it kind of brings me to realize that he almost just like you know math that out and so mm-hmm. <laughs> like you can definitely tell when character x swears the third ideal you can mm-hmm. tell almost exactly what where he is in his character arc and his motivations because they have changed. Yeah, um, in that sense. So that is really cool. Yeah, I think often success of a story can be measured in how many characters successfully have a character arc, right? Okay. Um, I was complaining, uh, like I don't know, 
couple months ago on the podcast about the Unwanted series. Yes. And there was a lot of problems with that series and, <laughs> and you should not waste your time with it. <laughs> like, uh, again, for the most, the most, the thing that most uh, influenced that, that we realized is that like, I'm just way too old to be reading that. Book. It was <laughs> like a young, young adult book yeah. that I picked up because I was an idiot. So anyway, uh, all those complaints <laughs> aside, only the main character has a character arc. And that's something that I realized while um, analyzing this is I think that was one th- of the main things that I didn't like about it, that none of the characters were changing except for the main character. Right. And oh, so all okay. of the other characters felt fake in that, in that sense, you can compare that to, yeah, Stormlight archives, basically any Pixar film, oh, right? Okay, yeah. Like Disney Pixar film will yeah. have like characters and then all of the characters have changed. Going. Like think of yeah. even like, I don't know, Monsters Inc. Like just pick one <laughs> and you can like look through and say like, man, if a character has screen time, they have change. Yes. You know? Oh, and, that's a good point. And they're going to have like, even often they will like plug in like a small personal little climax for that character somewhere. Yeah. You know, or a time that they had an opportunity for a climax and they fail it. Okay. Yeah. I like that a lot. I think that there is a positive correlation between how good a story arc is and how good a character arc is Mm -hmm. because like you can have a story, but if no one grows, none of your, none of the characters grow throughout their interactions with the story, it it Mm -hmm. leaves you a little wanting. Yeah, for right? sure. And so I think that's what you s- felt in the Unwanted series. Yeah. Where, like, if you had Harry Potter, or if you had, like, Star Wars, right? Mm-hmm. So Luke has this this motivation change. He, he, he goes through, he just wants to get off Tatooine. And then mm-hmm. it goes into, you know, wanting to defeat the Dark Lord. This sounds very similar to Harry Potter, actually, when I phrase it like this. Right. <laughs> <laughs> when you switch it over to a fantasy sense, <laughs> yeah. But, like, if Luke maintained his initial level of motivation... Mm-hmm. or Leia or Han. Like Han just always was the smuggler. It would not be the story. We wouldn't have the great story that we have today. Yeah. And I, I like your point that if only Luke changed, it would not be a great as great of a story because you get to see Luke, Leia, Han, all of the main characters go through their own personal development arc. Yeah. And it, it just would not have been as interesting of a story if only Han did or if only Leia mm-hmm. did. So, yeah. Yeah, it's a good point that like that's a that's a key relationship between the two. Like the story and the story arc will provide opportunities for the character to for the characters to be challenged and change and, and grow and overcome and fail, right? Yeah. Um so it's providing those chances for like small personal climaxes for the characters. And and again for those like opportunities for them to grow and change. And I think you're right that Star Wars, uh especially the original trilogy, does it really well. The other one, as you're speaking, that came that comes to mind is like all of the Marvel cinematic universe yeah. that we saw over like <laughs> you know 20 like i guess 2007 to like 2019 or 2020 they're still going yeah they're still going but that, those are kind of like that was yeah. like the first big phase one right. or whatever right um up like basically up through infinity war yeah think of especially like tony and like captain america how yeah. every movie I, I still think that like captain america civil war is the best movie in the marvel cinematic universe like, okay, that's my yeah. favorite one yeah um, that's a good one because there's like story wise, story arc wise there's really nothing going on like there's nothing going on in that that influences the major story but it's still in, it's incredibly captivating because there's this huge clash of wills going on right yeah. between iron man and captain america that is all all predicated on their character arcs and where they are at the time right where tony has started from this person who is incredibly selfish um and he <laughs> is you know and he has grown to fear like his own power and his selfishness and is willing to give that up to like the the accords or whatever like yeah. the thing that they're trying to sign that's going to take right. power away from them whereas captain has started as this person who's, who's always been selfless and has started to see that as like a weakness of himself and is trying to kind of take control of his life <laughs> and is and is trying to own right and so they're kind of both they've they're at their like antithesis like yeah. they're farthest away from where they were and they've actually both probably gone a little bit too far and civil war is them like kind of clashing and coming back and yeah. then over like the infinity, the two infinity war movies, they kind of like reconcile that and they kind of self-actualize and they end up in like a healthy, a healthy circumstance. But the point is that over what they did is over each movie had a story arc that was basically just a, a point for those characters to change and those characters to develop. Right. And civil war is like the maximizing of that <laughs> where there's really no story arc going on. It's just like the characters growing and developing and changing. Oh yeah. That's really interesting. The, so I, I think like a, another way to kind of say that is that that character development arc or character arc can mm-hmm. is basically how does how a character would ch- make a decision based on where they are in the story arc. Mm-hmm. So earlier in the story oh, arc, yeah. their decision may be different than where it is at, at this point in the story or at the end of the story. Yeah, yeah, um, that's a really good point. But yeah, 
uh, you you mentioned earlier, kind of like a the the, the character arc and how like positive negative change and mm-hmm. all of that. So I want to focus a little bit more on that because okay. I, I think that's a really interesting topic that we can dive into a little bit more. Yep. And so especially like the negative change, because mm-hmm. I, I <laughs> like the the positive change is. is pretty prevalent in a lot of books mm-hmm. right but i i'm more interested in like negative change that you would see in a protagonist not necessarily an antagonist mm-hmm. so like frodo right we we see a negative change in his morality in his power level like he is physically deteriorating as he's right. progressing through the story so like what what would be some more examples of kind of like a negative or a uh, a with I guess a withdrawal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. A negative character arc. Yeah. As a negative character. I think generally if they are going to have a negative power arc, they are, they are probably starting from a position of power. Now Frodo is, ex- is entirely an exception. To that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he starts weak. He's at, weak and he gets weak and he gets weak. <laughs> I'm sorry. Did you think he could get weaker? You were wrong. He can get even more weaker. Yeah. But like, uh, the reason I say that, like, uh, Lightbringer comes to mind, Lightbringer series. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's, um, and w- without getting too spoilery, because there's a lot of really powerful characters in uh, Lightbringer series, because it's just a really powerful magic system. <laughs> but um, there is one character specifically who like sort of loses his access to the magic system at one point in the series. I think it's in like book two or three. Um, yeah. And so, and it it is defining for him yes. because so much of his self image is wrapped around it and caught up in how powerful he is yeah right yep. and so it entirely like shatters him you yep. know to just like lose access to his powers like you can't do it anymore like who are you you know <laughs> and he has to like kind of like find that out again yeah you know he's like how, how like who am i like what do i want to do how do i want to do it you know he's like faced with all these like huge questions about himself um he's also another character that is he, he is extremely selfish you know yeah and he's very and he's very he's only acting in his own self-interest and because he's so powerful he can Right. And so when like that's taken away from him, it forces him to kind of face that. I think even you could say even potentially like Iron Man like, <laughs> yeah. does that in like the very fr- like that's what happens. Right. He's this exactly, incredibly yeah. well wealthy, powerful person. You know, he's like gives this demonstration and he like holds his arms wide and a hill- hillside blows up behind him. Right? Like, <laughs> he's that much of a megalomaniac. Right. Um, and then he's like stripped of his wealth, of his power, and he's thrown in a dungeon, you know, and he has to face like his selfishness and his decisions over the course of like that that have led him to this point. I, I, I really like that, especially the contrast between like Frodo, who's a slow deterioration yeah. versus uh, the two examples that you just gave, which are pretty immediate. They're both very interesting, mm-hmm. right? Because you get character decisions and character arc where with the immediate change and how that personality or how that character has to react to that versus a you know like the slow fade where mm-hmm. um you know yeah. how frodo starts to react to it and how it's it's almost like more dangerous to slow fade um for a character because it's yeah. you know it's like that snowball effect right you, yes yeah it's not that bad right yeah that, that kind of thing i think another uh kind of example which i'm really excited to see would be king killer chronicles oh yeah so uh, because killer, we know that's gonna you're right <laughs> it's yeah. gonna happen it's so gonna happen. kavoth is a, at the beginning of the story he's like lost his magic we don't know what's happening but then he's telling the uh the bard or whoever's going to tell his story about how he was like all powerful mm-hmm. and so we're, we're getting kind of both sides of the coin there because we're seeing both the um increase in power mm-hmm. but we know that decrease is coming mm-hmm. and so i i'm really excited to see how that plays out yeah um because we don't know how he loses his power. Was mm-hmm. it a sudden event? Was it something that he did? I, I we don't know. So I, I'm yeah. really excited to see that and how that's going to play out over this third book if we ever get it. For sure. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, we to switch over to like the villain side. I don't. We are not spoiler free for Song of Ice and Fire, right? Yeah. And so like I won't talk about it too much here. But there is a there is a character, and if you if you've read or watched the show, you'll know. But there is a character, a villain whose identity is wrapped up in their power right um who loses a a hand and therefore loses access to that yeah that power right and so i don't want to talk too much about like what but just i I would encourage you to think on that a little bit of from the villain side like kind of what his arc looks like from there again when his power is stripped from him very suddenly in a way that's actually kind of similar to yeah um to the to the kind of the first two examples that we talked about yeah i think another example of like a slow fade would be anakin Oh yeah. Um, so like we 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 talked about the OG trilogy. Let's talk about prequels now. So Anakin, 
you know, he he is the child that's going to bring balance to the force. He ha- he is this all powerful, the highest midichlorian count that anyone's ever seen, <laughs> <laughs> greatest pod racer. Yeah, uh, <laughs> like I'm throwing my money on Anakin, but yeah. he he goes into this, and I think the Clone Wars does a really good job of showing that deterioration. That like you see it slightly in uh, Attack of the Clones, and then heavily in Revenge of the Sith, and it feels very sudden. Mm. And so I really like Clone Wars, how it fills in that gaps, because over the seven seasons, you see all the little things Yeah, slowly kind of, you know, it adds to his power, his like power mm-hmm. level of, you know, he's able to do more things with mm-hmm. the force. However, it's subtracting from the morality um, yeah. from the light side. He's moving closer to the dark side. Yeah. And, you know, it starts out, you know, just with little things like I'm just going to disobey the council. Yeah. Right. That's how they get you. That's how they get you. I'm just going to get this girl pregnant. Like, it's just like little <laughs> things. <laughs> Just little things. Yeah, exactly. And you, <laughs> and you can see how that you know progresses into what is the greatest villain of all time, Darth mm-hmm. Vader. And uh, uh, to do like an even further callback, where story arcs don't, or the story arc and the character arc don't really coincide, is because like Anakin's story arc kind of ends when Vader is born, mm-hmm. and then Luke's kind of follows Vader's. And so like you know you can have multiple you can have multiple character arcs from like especially in like a longer series like Star Wars. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the like Anakin in the prequels is an interesting example because it feels like by the time it's like Order 66 and like this is happening, right? It it feels like at that time Anakin's climax has already happened. Like I I do think that like yeah. his climax comes with like his fight with Obi-Wan is probably like if you had to like name something in in terms of like his his almost like his story arc yes climax but his, the decisions and in his personal character arc that led him to that that is it has already been decided it's already been decided he's yeah that that's the physical manifestation of his decisions yeah it's that fight but it like if that fight hadn't happened he would have still been on the dark he, he would have transitioned to the dark side so yeah. I, that's a really good point yeah for sure negative arc in morality it can be really tricky to do but it's like it's really satisfying to just like to watch through yes right yeah <laughs> um, again like i i come back to zuko in avatar which we're not spoiler free for but zuko in the first episode is like the bad guy yep you know he's like introduced and he has a nasty scar in his face and he throws <laughs> fire and you're like that's obviously the bad guy yeah, he, he's right. dressed in like evil armor like it's yep. really him he's, he's the baddie yeah and again we won't like spoil anything but the one of the reasons we love the show so much is because first of all the reason that zuko is the way he is is entirely justified by his backstory. Um, so it makes him a believable character. He's not just bad just to be bad. Like, he, he's a believable character. But then his... He has a lot of change and fluctuation and questioning in his morality. And he does, like, go through some power cycles. Like, he, he gets stronger and weaker in different times. But the main thing that's changing for him is this kind of, like, quest of, like... Basically, does his morality matter to him? And then once... If he figures out that it does, how does that change what he what he does and who he is? And how does he kind of reconcile those things? And it just, it makes for a really satisfying, both the times when he moves positively and negatively along his kind of like arc through the story, all all of them, again, make sense because they are supported by the story. So there's like a really nice meshing of those two things there. But they're also like, as a, as a viewer, they're really, they really draw you in to his character. Yeah. I think Zuko has one of the greatest character arcs of all time. Like, <laughs> I, I just, I, I really one enjoy... Of your yeah, he, he is one of my favorites. So, like, I guess I'll ask that question. Like, what what is your favorite character arc? Or, like, what are some of your favorite character arcs that we, we see in sci-fi fantasy? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, Zuko, 100%, he would be on that list. It's actually, like, for some reason, I didn't actually prepare for this question. And I should have, because, like, you always <laughs> ask it. I always ask it. Yeah. You always ask it, so, like, I should have. I think anime will specifically lend itself to power arcs, typically. Yep, yep. Um, and so they there are, like, some really satisfying power arcs in 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 like especially like shonen type uh, yeah. anime which i watch a lot of but ed in edward in full metal alchemist mm, has a really good yeah. matching of both like i don't think he necessarily has like a morality arc but he has like definitely sort of like a self-actualization type of arc like he has some traumas that he's trying to like resolve right and he's also kind of fighting with like who do i want to be in in this world um so he first of all does have like a really strong power arc like that dude levels <laughs> up you know yep um, and he's kicking ass by the end of the like show just like by himself yep. it's awesome to watch but his, his, I guess, arc and his change in, I think self-actualization is the best way to put it. Kind of this process of like, here's the gifts that I have. Like, wh- what do I want that to turn into or who do I want to be as a result of that? 
Um, I just think he has a really sad. It's like sixty episodes, and it just yeah. it takes you through a lot. Yep, I'm glad that you brought up anime, um, yep. because another like negative correlation. Because I I honestly just think that those are more satisfying, maybe because we don't get a lot of them. Is uh is light through Death Note, mm. which which mm-hmm. is a good one. I think you've been mm-hmm. rewatching that. You, you want to talk about that? Oh, it looks like you yes, want. Yes. It looks like you want to talk. So I'll I'll, I'll give you the floor. <laughs> Cracks knuckles. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> So Death Note is, first of all, a fucking incredible show. Yes. <laughs> um, we love that. If you don't know the concept of it, essentially, uh, there's a character named Light. He's a high school student. Um, he's like a graduating high school senior. He's incredibly intelligent, one of the smartest kids in the nation. And he finds a Death Note on the ground. And it just has Death Note on it. And it has some rules written into it. And he essentially figures out that he, if he writes someone's name in the Death Note, um, that person dies like 40 seconds later of a heart attack. And this is this is all like first episode content, right? Um, and so he decides uh, that he is going to use that power to start killing criminals. And so he just starts writing criminals. He's the good guy. He's the good guy. Like yeah. he's just he's basic. He's like he's judge and executioner, judge, yes. jury, and executioner. Yep. Um, and so he watches the nightly news. If somebody commits a heinous crime, he writes down their name and they die. Seem, seems fine. Seems fine. Right? <laughs> um, and so he he has this kind of like morality of like I like there is all this evil in the world. I have the power to fix it. Like I have this incredible power. I'm, that's just, I'm going to use it to fix the world. I'm going to build a better world for everyone. But obviously like not having a trial, right? There's, uh, there, <laughs> there's, right. there's some, there's some more moral problems with, especially when you start getting outside of like, okay, yes, that guy robbed a store at gunpoint. That's a bad thing to do. Does he deserve to die? Light says that he does. And he gets to make that unilateral decision. Yep. Right. But society doesn't get to say, we want a death penalty for this or not. Right. We um, want rehabilitation. Right. Rather than just nixing them. Right. And so an investigation is opened into, because eventually they figured out that like someone is doing this. <laughs> um, and so they're going to find him. And so they uh, recruit a character who's just the, named the L, like the letter L. Um, and the entire story plays out. Again, this is all like first or second episode information. The story is playing out between L, who's this hyper intelligent investigator, versus Light, who's this hyper intelligent mass murderer, essentially. Yeah, demigod. Demigod. But, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, like he views himself as a he, he views does. himself as a god. Yeah. And the, kind of his like ego and that's wrapped up in all of that. But like, is his are his actions justified, um, regardless of how he sees himself? And so the, it opens up a lot of those questions. And the whole show is about kind of their clash. Yeah. Um, and I think for the most part, Light's power arc is very fast. Like I think he is fully realized in his power of like how he controls the death note by like episode six out of 25. Yeah. That's the other thing. It's a very short series, by the way. It's yep. only 25 episodes um, for the, like the first season. And then there's like a follow-up season that's like half that length or something. Yeah. But the first season is like kind of the, the main one that, that we talk about and the one that has kind of contains this storyline because um, the follow-up s- season is a follow-up story. So anyways, uh, Light has a very fast power arc, um, but he probably has, he has a lot of movement in his morality arc that's basically the whole point of the show is like how does this power affect light's psyche and morality and everything yeah and l i think probably doesn't have a lot of arc i don't think so you know he's pretty consistent in like who he is and he's like the really smart guy um who's like gonna find the bad guy like that's his kind of role yeah that is kind of interesting because now that i'm thinking about it like who in that show has a uh character arc besides light yeah and that kind of contradicts what one of our previous points where it's like you want all the characters to have these character development arcs maybe just because it's so short that kind of works i think that's part of it um there's also just not a lot of named characters yeah um that's true it's it's like there there's a couple of investigators who are working with l um there are a couple of other characters that light gets introduced to um that have like kind of minor arcs playing out i think if anything l's arc is probably linked to like he starts kind of coming out. He's like very secretive. Again, his name is the letter L. Yeah. <laughs> um, so he starts kind of like coming out of that and taking more risks and becoming a more like kind of active and involved player. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Um, so that's like some of the change that he goes through. He basically, as he's not finding light, who he, he doesn't know who light is, but as he's not finding him, like he goes through changes to get more serious, basically. Yeah. More, okay. Take more risks and that sort of thing. So like there, there is some change there. The more we're talking about it, the more that I think that I am coming to the conclusion that those are my favorite type of character arcs are ones that are the slow burn, the slow (laughs) devolving character arcs, because I think that's just such a fascinating look at human psyche. I think another really great example of this is Walt from Breaking Bad. Mm, uh, yeah. it's, it's all those like little decisions where like not spoiling anything, but like he, he gets cancer. He needs to pay for his cancer treatment so that his family is 
you know, set up. So he starts making methamphetamine, yeah. right? Just like small things, right? Small um, things. <laughs> <laughs> but all the decisions that kind of lead him to become the drug lord that he is. Yeah. It's just like with light, with uh, Walt from Breaking Bad, mm -hmm. you can almost, I think they're so effective because you can almost like put yourself in those shoes and say like, I could make those decisions. Yeah. I could make that decision. I could make the next one. And it's, it's almost like scary to mm -hmm. see all the decisions and the arc that they go through. And I think it's so effective because it's like, that could be me. Right? Yeah. I don't want to be where they're at at the end but I, yeah. I understand the justifications for the reasoning yeah yeah and, and i think you're right because they are done in such small steps it's easy to follow like well it's not that big of a change from last episode or yeah you know or where we just were yeah which is a little bit different than you know getting your hand cut off and your entire life changes yes right, <laughs> right? like yeah. that's harder to uh, relate with yeah for sure um ender also has a bit of a negative yeah character arc that's a good one um, yeah because and, and not that not necessarily like in a morality sense um but he's under like these extreme pressures right and these extreme stresses and he is also having this kind of internal war with himself between like the val side and the peter side of him um, which he sees as like good and evil while it feels like the the primary climaxes in the story are happening around like battles and like strategic things that are happening like there is some truth to that um, but there's this enormously complex character arc that's going on inside of Ender, which you get because, like, you get in Ender's internal monologue. Yep. Um, that is kind of dark. And there are, like, some dark turns in Ender's psyche as he's going through, like, kind of this, the journey that takes place over the over the course of the story. And it's not that he's necessarily getting, like, less moral, um, but he's getting more comfortable with doing amoral things. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. He probably also had, like, he's getting, he is becoming more uh, effective, um, but he's also be maybe kind of losing his grip on not quite sanity, but like he's not, he's becoming less grounded, you know, and yeah. kind of who he is. And he's like questioning some of those things. Um, so there's, there's just a lot of tidal forces going on inside of Ender um, that make for a really interesting character arc that accompanies is also like, also happens to be super interesting, <laughs> like strategic story arc that's going on yeah. as a, as kind of a backdrop. Yeah. There's a lot of parallels with Ender and Anakin in mm -hmm. the sense of like the climax of the story arc, the, the events that led up to it or the character development that led up to it or the character arc that led up to it is kind of already has made sure that the climax of the story will happen because the climax of the character arc has already happened. Yeah. So Ender or yeah. So Ender has made decisions in his life and he, you know, reaches this climax, which inevitably leads to the climax of the story. I think that those they're slightly offset mm -hmm. as well as like Anakin, like he he's turned to the dark side and then the climax of the prequels, series i think is that uh the, the fight on um mount doom or whatever it's called uh, yeah. <laughs> Mustafar. Um, yeah Mustafar. but so i i think that that's that's a really interesting point yeah i think both of those do a good job of letting the decision you, you mentioned decisions again we were talking about that earlier but both of them do a good job of letting the decisions that the characters make have significant influence on the outcome of the stories right um so and not even immediate, right? It's not like I, I I do this thing A or B and the A or B thing happens. Um, but like Ender makes small decisions and choices in like wording and how he treats people that come back to affect his life like chapters later, right? And Anakin like does very similar things, yep. you know? The Avatar series does a really good job of every character having a character arc. Yeah. Especially for a kid's show. <laughs> decisions that Aang makes will come up and affect him like episodes later. Yes. And Zuko does the same thing and, and Sokka and like all the, all these characters can have the power to make decisions that will come back and affect the storyline. And it's like, I'm so proud of them for making the decision and to do that and allowing the story, allowing the story to play out that way, because there could have been an assumption like a kid's not going to remember what happened three episodes ago. Yeah. You know, we can't let that affect this one, but they do. And it, and it totally works. Dave Filoni is awesome. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This, this has all been great conversations. I realized I didn't actually really answer my own question, like, what is my favorite character arc? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so let, let's go back to that. My, my favorite of all time, I think, is Jamie Lannister. Okay. Um, so from A Song of Ice and Fire, Game of Thrones, yeah. Jamie Lannister starts out as this character that you loathe, right? Mm -hmm. He is pushing children out of towers, trying to kill them, uh -huh. right? And then it comes into... Big baddie. Big baddie. And like, like it's like, okay, you can't... I, I While having sex with his sister. Let's yeah, throw I mean, it out there. Oh, whoa. Spoilers. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if you just throw him out of a tower. I didn't like, say who. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It I'm just totally kidding. 
<laughs> I, I think that is a well-known i think almost anyone in this world knows that jamie lannister likes to fuck his sister yeah i think that's that that is well well established at this point yeah um, want to make someone a villain <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah here's a good way to make me hate him <laughs> <laughs> yeah have them screw their sister and throw little children out, out of the towers window. it's pretty effective it's pretty effective um but like blunt, but effective. <laughs> but yeah, it's not a it's it's not a scalpel. It's a hammer. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but but all that to say, like Jamie's character arc by you know book three, book four, like you are rooting for Jamie Lannister. You want him to succeed. Yeah. And it's just really impressive how Martin is able to write that character to someone that you hate to someone mm-hmm. that you. Like, I really like Jamie Lannister as yeah. a character. And, like, I want him to see him succeed. And I think that that is just a very effective use of character development or character arc. Yeah. Is to have someone that you hate move into someone that you are rooting for and that you really like. Um, and I think mm-hmm. Martin just did a phenomenal job there. Yeah. Yeah. It does make you ask ask some questions at like some point. You're like, why am I rooting for this yeah, guy? Exactly. You're right. You know? When I rewatched through Game of Thrones. Mm-hmm. Like I, you know, I was I had finished um, the last book that was out. I was like, I'm gonna rewatch through Game of Thrones. Like let let's do that. And then like with in the book, I'm like, hell yeah, Jamie Lannister, let's go. And then I'm like watching the first couple episodes. I was like, what the hell? Yeah. <laughs> wait, I don't, wait, wait a second. Um, I forgot how bad this guy was. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, but I I think that that is also kind of a a good example of a. I don't know if he's an antagonist, but like, mm-hmm. or a bad guy in the story, but him having a good character arc. We've talked a lot about the people who start good and have the bad character arcs oh, and yeah. descend, but I think that's a cool um, negative um, to that is, is to see mm-hmm. you know bad people start to become good. Yeah, and so I wanted to throw that out there as one of the best examples of character arc or character development that yeah. I've ever seen. For sure, um, for sure, it is it is worth reading. <laughs> yes, yeah, so. uh, and apparently we're getting more books so. Who knows? Fingers crossed. <laughs> but yeah, so th- this is this has been an excellent discussion. I, yeah. I really enjoy kind of thinking about this because it's not it's not something that I typically think about. It's not the first thing that I go to when I'm thinking mm-hmm. about a story. I'm thinking more about the story arc or the events that are happening, not necessarily how a character is developing through the story. That's kind of like that second layer yeah. when I'm analyzing. So it's been really fun to talk through that with you. Yeah. Um, to to figure out um, some good examples, some bad examples, and how it is correlated with an overall story arc. Yeah, for sure. Um, for so, sure. Like I said, like it, it, it can take a me from liking a story to loving a story. You know. That's great. Yeah. Um, and it has helped me in preparation for this and in talking through this kind of, and uh, I guess narrow in on why. You know, why do I love or hate a story? Yeah. Um. And again, I loved realizing like that's why I didn't like Unwanted. <laughs> I mean, in a, in a, yeah. In, alongside a lot of other things, that was a major factor. <laughs> right. Um, so just being able to like articulate that has been like I don't know, just really satisfying for me. <laughs> yeah. It's been bugging me a long time. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So we we want to hear your uh your favorite. What character arcs do you think that are really well done? Which ones are you wish you had been had been done better. Yeah. Do you disagree with us that you know does Jamie Lannister's character arc the worst one that you've seen? Which, in case you're wrong, but like I do want to hear that <laughs> feedback uh, because like uh, we really enjoy talking about this. But like what we've realized is that we enjoy talking with you all even more mm-hmm. um, than just like the two of us conversating back and forth because it's it's cool to see different ideas and everything. So yeah. so hop onto the Discord or contact us through uh, Instagram or any other social media and let us know what your your thoughts are on. Uh, character development arcs are character arcs yep. and let's let's talk about them because it, it is a really interesting topic that i don't think it's talked about a lot yeah um yeah so, it deserves more airtime yeah sure. absolutely so. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah if that's all you had that's it i i have really enjoyed this episode and i look forward to doing it again cheers yep. buddy cheers cheers